Today, we have a very special treat for everybody watching, because not only do we have an exciting announcement, but we also finally cover a topic that I'm sure many people have been waiting to see. We travel to the parts of North America that the Algonquin people called their home in order to discuss a truly terrifying legend, an evil spirit that prowls the northern forests of the Atlantic coast, a monster that can be found up and down the Great Lakes region of the United States and Canada. The creature that I'm referring to is part of the most famous set of stories to originate from Algonquin folklore. These stories indeed refer to the Wendigo. Some believe that it was a large monster. Another saw it as a spirit capable of possession. The manner in which the Wendigo manifests itself depends entirely on the beliefs of the individual and the Algonquin can be broken down into several groups of indigenous people. If we put aside the Wendigo's appearance briefly, there was a general agreement as to what the Wendigo was and what it represented. It is almost always associated with cannibalism, famine and greed that came with the long cold winters, which is why so many saw it as a malevolent, supernatural entity. So what does the Wendigo actually look like? There are two very distinct archetypes that I'm sure many of you would recognize, a large-looking demonic beast, normally of the head or skull of a stag, complete with some kind of antlers or horns. This type of Wendigo is one that has become quite popular today, and it's an image that I'm sure many of you recognize from a lot of popular media. But this particular image seems to be a more modern interpretation, I remember seeing this imagery when first watching the TV show Hannibal, which of course has its own underlying themes of murder and cannibalism. At the time, I didn't really understand the Wendigo symbolism because I didn't really know much about the Wendigo and its own association with cannibalism and acts of evil. So why does this version of the Wendigo have antlers reminiscent of a stag? Sadly, I couldn't really find a conclusive answer. There isn't much mention of the one that goes appearance in traditional Algonquian folklore. And what we do see certainly doesn't describe a stag. So there could be some confusion between the concept of the Navajo skinwalker, or this very well could be a modern stylistic interpretation. Either way, the stag is an animal that appears of folklore all around the world, though it's normally associated with woodland deities and fertility. It's also an animal that the Native Americans highly respected. So if we do go with the concept that the one that it was seen as a symbol of corruption, the fact that it then manifests as an animal that the natives held in such high regard makes it seem as if nothing is safe in the when the ghost curse, which does highlight the seriousness of the warnings and meanings interwoven into these stories. The more traditional appearance of the Wendigo is closer to a haggard and decomposing corpse. Its skin is stretched extremely tightly over its bones, creating a thin, translucent layer of desiccated flesh from which its bones are ready to burst. Its complexion varies from a sickly white to an ashy grey. It has long, spindly fingers with sharp nails that it uses to tear its victims into pieces. The easiest way to describe this type of Wendigo is as a gaunt skeleton that looks like it has risen from the grave. Wherever the Wendigo goes, it is followed by the odor of death and decay. It is a vile creature with jagged, misshapen teeth that, at Tim's, resemble yellow fangs. In this form, the Wendigo may be a creature that resembles a humanoid, but I assure you, they are nothing short of anyone's worst nightmare. There's an interesting description that comes from a new law, that belief, one that goes with giant creatures made of ice that would dwarf other human beings. And this was because every time I went to go eat a person, they would grow in proportion to the meal. So the bigger the meal, the bigger they grew. And this was one of the ways they used to describe the one that goes insatiable hunger, because it created this vicious cycle with the more the when they grow consumed, the bigger and stronger they grew. But it would have to consume more and more to satisfy its ever-growing hunger. This definitely gives us an interesting contrast. You have these enormous gluttonous creatures 
And then you have these thin, gaunt husks that are wasting away, but both still suffer from starvation. And that is what we consider the curse of the Wendigo. Its hunger can never be sated. Its quest for new victims is eternal, when the girls are always regarded as evil. And this is in no doubt because of the cannibalistic nature. But how does one become such an evil entity? There is the belief that humans could turn into when the goes if they were overcome by greed. These stories are told as a way to encourage moderation and essentially scare individuals into behave in a certain way. Those who committed unspeakable acts of cannibalism were also thought to become Wendigo. And this belief is where many attribute the start of the Wendigo legend. There were, however, extremely dark times where famine was so bad that people had no choice but to resort to cannibalism just in order to survive and make it through the long, cold winter. It's not really common today, but in times of extreme famine, some of the Native American people would perform a ceremonial dance that involved wearing a mask and dancing backwards behind the drum. This ceremony was mostly considered to be a satirical way to reinforce the seriousness of the Wendigo taboo. Many saw the Wendigo as a metaphor that represented imbalance and disharmony, not only in an individual but in society as a whole. This idea of selfishness does also tie in of the fact that when the girls were seen as solitary creatures, often being referred to as spirits of the lonely places. So what makes the Wendigo so special, and why are we so scared of them? The possession of a Bednego isn't like a generic spirit or demon. It chooses its victim very carefully and slowly eats away at their sanity. It enters the thoughts and peaks in mind of countless nightmares unable to sleep. They start experiencing a burning sensation throughout their entire body. This has been described as Wendigo fever, and there have been countless tales of people running stark naked through forests in the dead of night, claiming that they have Wendigo fever. Now, as a supernatural entity, you'd expect some kind of supernatural abilities. But most of these are exactly what you would imagine, the one to give is extremely fast and has unnatural strength, despite how frail some of them may look as expert hunters. They have heightened endurance and senses, making it so they can hunt in all manner of terrain and temperature. The older the Wendigo gets, the stronger it becomes. As its corruption spreads through the forest, so does its influence on nature. Some are capable of controlling woodland creatures, and others are so powerful they can control the weather, with the oldest able to summon a darkness capable of concealing the sun, making it so no one is safe, regardless of time or location. Despite what we perceive to be just stories, there have been numerous cases over the years of people committing horrid crimes, claiming that they were possessed by a Wendigo. In 1878, a Native American man named Swift Runner butchered an eight. His entire family that winter was said to have been particularly harsh and swift, and a son had sadly died because of the extreme conditions. Now, we don't know if Swift and his family ate the boy to survive, but the mutilated remains of his wife and five other children were later found. He eventually confessed to killing and eating his entire family, but he was adamant that his actions were due to a Wendy opposition. So to devour his son turned him into a Wendigo. Did he butcher his family because he felt they wouldn't survive the winter? Or did he value the self-preservation of his own life over his family's? The answer to those questions will most likely never know. Another rather famous case is that of Jack Fiedler and his brother Joseph, who were arrested for the murder of over a dozen people. As the chief of his people, Jack was thought to be capable of removing evil, which is why he got away with killing so many, claiming that they were all possessed by a Wendigo. Jack managed to escape captivity during a routine walk outside, and he eventually hung himself before the trial came to a conclusion. His brother Joseph, however, wasn't so lucky. 
he was sentenced to death by Magistrate Ellsworth Perry. Despite the numerous appeals of his innocence, Joseph, ironically enough, was eventually given a pardon, but it came three days after his death in 1909. These type of cases led people to believe that it might be a more serious mental issue, one that would later be dubbed Wendigo psychosis, the deep craving for flesh. But whether it was a real mental disorder is something that was heavily debated as the number of reported cases decreased dramatically in the 20th century when the Algonquin people adapted to European ideologies and began to live less rural lifestyles. There's no doubt that the Wendigo myth has changed and evolved over the years. It's now become another monster that reflects our own issues as humans greed, selfishness, and in some extreme or metaphoric cases, cannibalism. It's unlikely that many of the Native American tribes still believe in the legend of the Wendigo as adamantly as they once did. To them, the Wendigo was an evil spirit that embodied everything they hated. It can be interpreted as a symbol of corruption from what they perceive to be outsiders changing their landscape and the beliefs of their people. Stories of the Wendigo were used as a way to encourage a balanced lifestyle and respect for one's peers and the world surrounding them. A creature with insatiable hunger, a spirit capable of possession or story meant to encourage cooperation and warn against the dangers of greed. As always, I've been your host, Wise Words of Life.